Great. So um, this is our second panel on film education in, in Africa. Um, I'm Lazal Bischoff. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a lecturer here in um, Film and Television Studies. This is my <coughs> home department. Um, I teach um, and do research on African film, and um, I'm also the founder of the African Motion Film Festival, uh, which is an African film festival that's been running in uh, Scotland, in Edinburgh, and Glasgow for the past 14 years. So um, I have a, a very deeply invested interest um, in film education, particularly film education um, in and on uh, Africa. We've done a lot of educational work through the African Motion Film Festival as well. So when Jamie approached me um, about the conference and said that he wants to do something around Africa, of course I was very keen to uh, become involved. Uh, we've put together a, a panel of people who um, are very, very experienced um, in using film as an educational tool um, in lots of different ways. Um, we, as, as Jamie said, we wanted um, Eric Cabrera, who is one of the founding, um, really one of the sort of pioneering directors of the Rwandan film industry to be here today, but unfortunately couldn't make it due to um, visa complications. So my um, very good friend and colleague, uh, Stephanie van der Peer, stepped in. Stephanie has been involved in uh, African motion and also specifically in a project around lost classics, lost African classics, um, uh, that we've done a lot of educational work around, so it was very appropriate to, to have her step in. So thanks for joining us at the last minute. Um, Steph, and also for Imru, thanks for coming up from London and for those who came all the way from South Africa to join us. So um, I'm going to give um, each one of you 10, 15 minutes to talk about your work and then we'll have a, a discussion. I want to just invite you if, when the other speaker is in the front, if you want to go and sit in the audience just to have a better view, um, feel free to, to do that. So we'll do um, the presentations in order of seniority, which means that <laughs> I'll ask um, Imru uh, Bakari to speak first. <laughs> So Imru is um, a filmmaker, a writer and a creative industries consultant. He studied at uh, the Bradford College of Art and is a graduate of the National Film and Television School. He also did some postgraduate studies at Goldsmiths College, University of London. He was from 1999 to 2004 the festival director of the Zanzibar International Film Festival in Tanzania, that's um, East Africa's premier film festival. He's a founder and director of the Tanzania Screenwriters Forum. He was also founder and director of CEDO, the film and video production and training organization in London. This was in the early 80s. He's a for former member of the advisory council of the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers, FEPASI, which is the, the premier organization of um, filmmakers in, in Africa. And he's currently a, currently a member of the Tanzania Independent Producers Association and also on the editorial board of the Journal of African Cinemas. <coughs> Worst. <laughs> okay. His professional work includes a number of film and television credits, and um, in 2013, I should say, um, which is sort of um, illustrative of his um, wealth of experience, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award um, from the African Film Festival in Leuven, Belgium, for his work in African cinema. Uh, thank you, Lizzo, and thank you, Scottish Film Education. Jamie, thank you very much and thank you for coming. Um, I must have a sort of preface to my introductory remarks that I will make, particularly pertaining to Eric Cabrera. His absence here from my, on my part is, is, is um, sadly traumatizing, but maybe indicative of the kind of beast in, which, in whose belly we now exist. Um, I don't see things getting better for black people, for people of color, for African people. Um, Rwanda is now a member of the British Commonwealth by electing to be a member. That hasn't helped them even in these moments when Britain is planning to use the Commonwealth as a backstop for its Brexit um, disaster. I hope none of you voted for it. You could raise your hands now if you did. <laughs> okay, and I'm not sure you'll be exonerated. Um, Eric's work is very important, and it's I, I, it's a miss for me. It's a missed opportunity to engage with him, with um, um, <laughs> Ferdos <laughs> Bulali, 
who is now the, one of the directors, the key movers at the Zanzibar International Film Festival. Because this dialogue, I think, is very important. And you will notice, or you may, may not notice, that what I have to say is really part of a conversation with people like Eric, who are now working and establishing a living African Film Center in Rwanda, Rwanda Film Center, and the Kwetu Film Institute, a training organization. They're actually doing stuff now. My work and what I refer to represents a perspective gleaned from the past um, within the context of the development of African cinema and my specific time in Tanzania between 1998 and 2008, right? Eric, con uh, as a sort of resonance from discussions earlier today, sorry, not my 15 minutes, okay? Right. <laughs> um, the issues raised this morning, very interesting issues. I just want to say Eric is not just a trainer or runner of, the, he's also a filmmaker. He's produced a number of important films, including 100 Days, the first film on the Rwanda genocide. Okay? He also produced a very interesting children's film, resonating from the discussion this morning, called Africa United. Um, it's a film about children traveling from Rwanda to South Africa to attend the World Cup in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, Cape Town, yeah? And that journey of children across Africa to this grand international event is the narrative of a very hilarious and interesting film. And adventurous film from a country that doesn't really have a premier film industry. And coming out of African cinema, very important, very few children's films, okay? So, <clears throat> I've decided to just, that you kind of know already, that you know already, to sort of head what I'm going to say today under the title of Film Education and or Training an African Experience of Cinema. And these introduction remarks, they are just introductory remarks, as I said, are framed by current realities in filmmaking and the kind of realities that frame what we might call African film cultures or various African film, an African film culture. <clears throat> national, transnational, global. As a preface, therefore, and in trying to shaping the perspectives which I bring to this discussion, this debate, I want to just refer to some foundation terms. One is education, the other is training. Sometimes used interchangeably, but for me, very important to make a distinction, and it's a distinction that I've been arguing for over the years. This is a definition which I find very useful. Paula Ferrari, I don't know if anybody knew his work, very important from Latin America, Argentinian, I think, but very important in the foundation or formulation of third cinema ideas, a Latin American cultural politics of the 1960s and 70s. Education, he says, and this, this is, this is a, from the introduction by Richard, Richard Schalt, which summarizes or introduces Paulo Ferreira's important text, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which came out in 1970 based on a number of essays written during the 1960s. The important part of this um, quotation or, or summary is that education is the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women are critically, critically creative and creatively deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. Importantly, Freire was a linguist, he was a, a, a pedagogue, and his idea was why do we need to teach illiterate people how to read and write? Is it just to vote for people who are going to kill them, or is it to vote for some to do something more in terms of their own agency? The other term is training. And this has been distilled 
out of my own engagement with these ideas and practices. Training really teaches the types of behavior and procedure that are required to fulfill a specific role. Training aims to improve capacity, efficiency, and productivity. And in the developmental politics and the discourse of development, people talk a lot about capacity building. This course, that course, and building capacity for development. Why do I start with that? I've always highlighted the limitations of what is generally passes for film training in Africa and the need for serious investment in film education, which is financially, culturally, and intellectually engaged in an attempt to fulfill the aspirations of African filmmakers. In charting that perspective I try to develop, it seems relevant to place my approaches in a global and pan-African perspective, noting the history and the experiences of African peoples in and of the cinema. Unavoidably, it seems critical that these observations are part of the current debates around development, and the UN now tells us it's not such so much development, it's sustainable development. So you get rid of your plastic bags, and we are happy, perhaps but we still have plastic chairs and plastic tables and plastic food. <laughs> and also, around the current new term, decolonization. And I say new term because it's, no, it's not really new. It's a now a new commodified discourse, basically. So let me just backtrack a bit and I want to go through fairly quickly to show where I'm coming from and how the ideas that we I'm engaging with in terms of African filmmaking, education, within the context of creative cultural industries becomes relevant to what we're saying here. <clears throat> so this is basically what I've been arguing for and that was <clears throat> one of the conclusions in a, a paper which I published at the end of 2018 in its journal, Communication Cultures in Africa. <coughs> now, as has been said, I was a member, founder member of CHEDO, CHEDO Film and Video Workshop, which existed between 1983 and 1993. CHEDO was one of the workshops that came into being with the advent of Channel 4, that important moment that transformed British film and television, the British film and television industries. It was supposed to open up a new space for creative freedom. It expanded and, in a way, broke television from the BBC, ITV monopolies, etc. That was what it tended to do, bring in new voices, independent voices, etc. By 1990, you know, that had crumbled, a new agenda leading to what we have today, Love Island, etc., to go. However, in 1986, there was an important conference in Edinburgh, third cinema conference, very important conference that produced a major BFI publication, Questions of Third Cinema. CHEDO was part of that conference, but they are not in that journal. Chedo's contribution to that conference eventually got published in Black Film Review, an American publication, in the same year. And Chedo was arguing in that the title of the, the piece in the, in the journal is Culture of Resistance Reflecting a True Image. Chedo was arguing instead of being the recipients of information, we become the givers of information defining our own time and space and histories. We were very much rooted in the third cinema idea. We were very much rooted in what people have called guerrilla filmmaking. We are all represented, associated with the wider African cinema and its decolonization project, which began even before us. The People's Account was one of the productions of, Ke of Chedo, which was effectively banned by Channel 4. The IBA refused to show it because we refused to say 
that the police were criminals, basically. And we said, no, this, the documentation is well recorded in Kwesi Owusu's publication, Storms of the Heart. But we took a stand and we were exiled in a way from the general culture of what became black British film culture, the dominant trend within it, which had other kinds of agenda, not necessarily different from us, but with different emphasis, which privileged positions that others felt were more conducive to the kinds of black intervention they wanted to have. The Chad opposition's papers spoke of the aim to convey social reality rather than to define social reality. In other words, we were not going to use film as a deconstructive tool to argue about the deconstruction of dominant images. We were there to put forward an agenda that would challenge the hegemony of what was available in the media. In so doing, we wanted to emphasize African-Caribbean agency. The idea that we had a position to speak from that was equal and valid within the media debate. I don't think they were ready for that at the time. They probably weren't ready for it even now. So that is a sort of background. I also run an independent company, which we have an own, our own politics with Channel 4, which makes that position even more interesting because black independent companies generally did not thrive. Black filmmaking took place within these workshops, these franchise workshops. <clears throat> so within that background, I got invited to go to ZIF. And I arrived at ZIF for the first festival in 1998. A lot of people don't realize that ZIF was the first major location in Africa for the exhibition of African films after Carthage and Fespaco. <coughs> Carthage began in 1966, Vespaco 1969, and ZIF was the first after that that was dedicated to promoting African cinema. It was an East African initiative. It was influenced by FEPASI, the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers. But it also came after the demise of the Mogadishu Pan-African Film Symposium. This was a series, an institution that was set up in Somalia in the late 80s to complement both Carthage and Fespaco, a forum for intellectual and critical debate on African cinema. The demise of Somalia, the political um, demise of the state, and the chaos that effectively ended that society and this initiative. But it was important and indicative of the aspirations of those filmmakers who we now refer to as the pioneers. They were not just making films, they were engaged politically and academically with developing and promoting African cinema and film culture. When I arrived at ZIF, the idea soon took hold about film training. And my own concern around that and its limitations come out of what I then became involved in, the kinds of training, the kinds of workshop. And it was not just at ZIF. I ended up in Rwanda in 2000, running a 12-week, well, 12 session, it was one well, over two months, course for English-speaking Rwandese who had been returning to Rwanda. Rwanda mainly speaking French, but then these guys had been exiled, and they come back, and the, most of the teaching was in French, and they wanted someone to address their um, needs. So I ran a course, Introduction to Cinema, in 1999. I also did another series of lectures <coughs> at the University of Dar es Salaam, lectures on cinema, looking at film history, you know, film aesthetics, um, general film theories, etc. And of course, out of that becomes a number of issues. What is the role of the workshop or the short course in a country or in a situation where you don't have formal film education, where you have limited resources, books, films to teach with, or films to show, to screen? Don't forget, digital technology you know, doesn't come till a little bit later after 2000. We're still using video. 
the BFI had put out a number of titles, Camera d'Afrique, Camera d'Arabe by Book Frevit Bougadier, one or two Sembene films, etc. Okay? The resources are quite stark. And of course, the idea of film education is not seen as a valid subject. Right? Interestingly, Mogadishu, Mogadishu, in the 80s and 70s, film education is still new in Britain. I mean, film education in England, in Europe, in Britain, but it is this thing of the 70s, basically. Okay? Um, so these issues become quite important. Never mind film education in schools or primary schools that we've been talking this morning. Part of the response to that was to bring the filmmakers of Tanzania together and we set up Tanzania Screenwriters Forum. We said, look, <coughs> the rationale being scripts are the foundation of the film industry. If you're going to make films, you've got to start with ideas, etc. If you want to work a camera, you can use the manual. And I can tell you to switch it on, switch it off, <laughs> which is what most people did and then call themselves cinematographers. So we started with um, Tanzania Screenwriters Forum. We put this group together in 2001. It led to my company, which I then established in Tanzania, developing a number of script ideas into a short film series which was produced in 2005 and 2008 called African Tales. Again, the issues. The forum revealed the need for training. In other words, how do you write a film script? How do you format a film script, for example? Okay, because we're focusing on screenwriting. <clears throat> In response, I created a 12, four, over four weeks, 12 lectures, 12 days, 12 full days called Writing the Screenplay. We ended up tutoring <coughs> a number of, of writers. We had um, five writers ended up completing the course. The African Tales um, project worked with about 15 writers. We ended up producing eight films, okay? Uh, but this was an independent um, initiative which I took on with my own company and nearly sent me bankrupt, mm -hmm. like it does most filmmakers. Right, some thoughts about film education in Africa. Just concluding. <coughs> As I argued in the case of the black British experience, it is very important to distinguish the African experience of cinema as something unique. People from the Asian, the Indian subcontinent, Asia, India, Pakistan, for example, have a long history of image production, the Indian film industry being, you know, indicative of that. Africans do not have that long history. Within our visual culture, cinema has a different kind of positioning. Okay. And one of the ways we can begin to understand that is understanding the impact of the Bantu education cinema experiment, Beke, which existed in East and Central Africa between 1935 and 1937. This was a project set up by the British government to train Africans, through the use of film, how to be governed. That's basically what it was. They were made in films to instruct Africans how they should be governed or allow themselves to be governed. The importance of this is that this project became a model for the film units that then um, came after it and the government approaches in all the African independent states in the Anglophone Africa, all their approaches to media, the use of media, mass media in their societies. So the, we have the Crown Film Units uh, and then the Anglophone attempts to set up television or radio and this project was the model. It also provided a model for apartheid South Africa to make films for their natives and how they should be addressed and what topics, etc., should be covered. Then, of course, we have the Nollywood phenomenon. 
the Nigeria popular cinema phenomenon of the 19, the, it begins in the 1990s, <coughs> comes to its sort of crescendo in the digital age of the 21st century. <coughs> century. <coughs> Here I would suggest rather and more urgent is the need not only for training, but for education. And it is more urgent now because of the contemporary culture within which we live, which I want to term a culture of appropriation and, a com and commodification. Appropriation and commodification. Everything can be sold. Everything is sold. No matter how radical or not it is. And we need to understand this process in which we are living and within which a lot of black creativity is coming to the fore. I want to conclude now. Sorry, a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to conclude on quite quickly is decolonialization, film education, decolonializing film education and training. Now, this is the big challenge because we live in the age of diversity. And of course, as I said, decolonization is the big cheese at the moment. Okay? Everybody speaks about it. But I want to suggest that decolonization has been the agenda that brought African cinema into its existence and gave it a validity as an entity within global cinema. I also want to rec remind us that diversity is an essential component of Africa. The African continent is a continent of diversity, from Cape to Cairo, however you want to look at it, from Dar es Salaam to Accra. And we know what are the consequences when nation states fail to reconcile those diversities. We see that in part of what they call tribal conflicts. We see it in Sudan at the moment. Okay, we see it in Cameroon. We see it in all the horrors that become, you know, part of the post-colonial experience. So these things are not new. If we're going to talk, however, about African education and decolonization and training, I want to suggest that we need to begin to engage with African visual culture and its study. There is no, as far as, as, far as I know, no particular agenda within an African university where this is being studied. What then is the role of the African university? What is the role of the various institutions and initiatives for film training? It brings into question a number of issues, questions of representation and the construction of the film image, techniques of cinematography, techniques of cinematography, the use of the way ethnicities are rendered, the, re the way color is rendered, right? the way the camera represents, not reality, but what can be captured of the historical world, innovations in film narrative, film criticism, film history. This is my final statement. Now, I just a few, I work at Winchester. I don't teach any of this at Winchester. <laughs> I try to integrate it in a number of courses. There are three courses, for example, that are among the courses I teach. I teach a course in um, approaches to cinema, theories, film theories. But it's no accident I begin with Napoleon by Abdel Gans, and I end with the Battle of Algiers. Okay? I also teach documentary and non-fiction film. Again, I try to integrate this. I also teach a film on gang a course on gangster and crime cinema. And I talk about the harder they come, the Jamaican film, the gangster film. And I begin to interrogate the gangster text in its global context. So, I just want to put that in there in terms of my decolonization process, but recognizing that decolonization is a principal part of the momentum that brought African cinema into existence and recognition. And this is where I hope to have a dialogue with Eric. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Imri. I look forward to sort of engaging more with those issues um, um, in the discussion afterwards. So next we have uh, Fadoz Bulbulia. Uh, Fadoz is uh, the co-director of Moments Entertainment, a film production company um, in South Africa. She is a director, a producer, a writer, an educator. educator. She's been involved as an activist in women's and children's uh, rights movements using theatre, film and art as mediums of expression and for uh, conflict res resolution. She's worked in many de developmental programs and facilitated multiple workshops in the, in the area of child's rights. Uh, she was involved in the establishment um, of the South African Charter on children's rights um, and she is the chairperson of the Children and Broadcasting Foundation for Africa, which I think you'll talk a bit more about. Fedos continues to train producers of children's media and is a sort of the speaker, presenter and participant at global children and media events. And she's currently, among uh, many other things, the director of uh, the Zanzibar International Film Festival that we heard a bit about the origins from Imru. So thanks very much for joining us, Fedos. We look forward to your talk. Johannesburg, city of gold, also known as Igoli, the richest metropolis in sub-Sahara Africa, a cultural hub and vibrant city with four million inhabitants. This is the city most Africans want to live in. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. You have talent. Ubuntu. This is what we should be preaching. Say what you want to say. Be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. Everyone here is talking about Ubuntu. And yet I don't see these BEE -E types going back to the townships and giving back to the places that they come from. Say what you want to. I'm the king of this place. Your own rightful hand. No one will come in here, not even the Messiah, and take the young kids off the streets and mess up my business infrastructure. No one. Who will you want to be now? Ghana Welcome, my children. It has always been my dream to have an African century. Sanctuary? Where all these children could come from different countries and no one will ever judge them. They come with talent. You know, arts and culture is the ultimate. They could sing, they could dance, they could, they could play instruments, they could... No one will ever judge them. They'll all come together as African children. He taught me You rich people, all the same. It's not like you poor people are any better. I should have known better than to come here with you. Then go back I'm to leaving. Uganda. Fine, go. I'm leaving. Watch and pray. Word is out that you've started a school and I'd, I'd... Shame, man, you're feeling out of place, yes. I'm sure. Oh. <laughs> Free your mind and express yourselves. This is what this school is all about. Free your mind Woo! and express yourself. Woo! 
free your mind and the rest will follow. I think happiness is the cure for everything. If there's a drop of happiness somewhere, it can spread and it can become a, a beautiful thing. What, what I'm going to bring is a smile. I'm going to bring passion. I'm going to bring happiness. I surround myself with that and I, I give off and I feed off of it. I, it is my life source in life. As a, for my soul, happiness is the sole sustenance to my existence. And darling, darling, Just as long as you stand, stand by me. Wow. Woo, yeah. I'm Olufemi. Olufemi. Yeah. And I know very soon you'll know about that name, Olufemi. You just call on my name. We would like to tell you our story. We are former Charles Walters. I've been in pain so long now. I'm glad you're here to listen. I've cried so many nights, but I've never felt some love from my mama, mama, oh mama, please dry my tears, mama, oh mama, please pray my tears. be all right it's gonna be okay just look right over your shoulder I'll be there there's a reason you made it this far I'm so proud of who you are now let the world see what is hidden in your heart you can do this Thank you very much. So I start with that, um, it being one of the films that we produced, and if you were South African, you would know that all the adult performers are very well-known South African artists. So you've got Yvonne Chaka Chaka, uh, Lutuli Dlamini, and um, the gentleman who's with the, with the performers is actually a musical director who worked a long time with Miriam Keva. And so, in terms of the work that we do, I chair the Children's Broadcasting Foundation for Africa. I'm a former teacher, um, and I really wanted to use the performing arts, uh, the, the, the arts industry, to talk about difficult topics. So in this film, we spent time with UNICEF in 2000, I think it was, when they were doing something, they did a study on violence against children. And they asked us to film in different countries, so we filmed in um, several African countries, and the issues around child soldiers, the girl child, um, female genital mutilation, these were topics that we were dealing with. And we wanted to use edutainment, education and entertainment, to deal with the issues. And so this was a film that we were able to do in 2012, and I'm very happy to say that um, Justine had produced a wonderful um, educational pack for us, which we have copies of. But just to talk um, briefly, I, was, I called it an Ubuntu approach, and I think some of you might know what Ubuntu means. I am because you are. And this is really an African concept, and in the South African context, 
my, my worries, my concern, my well-being is interrelated to yours. So I am because you are. And when I look at you, I'm looking at you in your eyes as you are looking at me. So we connect with each other and we care about, what you, about, about each other. So um, we started the Children and Broadcasting Foundation really in 1990, kind of 94. This was after the South African democracy. And I was part of an organization that really looked at drawing up the South African Children's Charter. So South Africa, those of you who know, coming out of apartheid, we had really four provinces. And post-apartheid, we had nine provinces. So we traveled around the country to talk to children, to young people, about their rights. And we were trying to bring in a rights culture. And in 1994, just before the elections, with the support of UNICEF, we drew up the South African Children's Charter, which is very much based on the UN Charter on Children's Rights. In 1995, I was invited to the First World Summit on, on children's television that took place in Australia. Some of you might know about it. The summit movement in children's media takes place every three years. We say it's kind of like the, um, the Olympics in children's media. And so every three years, people come together and they present the best of what they've done in the area of children and youth media. CB CBFA kind of started out of that movement. We went to Australia and then we were quite shocked. Firstly, we didn't see any people, any diversity. We saw white people only. We didn't see any local indigenous. There was no stories about them, about the people who should be part of the country. And more importantly, there were no children. So my thing was, this was a summit about children for children without children. I was a student activist, so I was detained in 1980 as a matric student. I went to jail, fighting the system. So I could not believe that there were no young people in a space that was talking about young people's issues. And I remember sitting next to the lady who actually used to run the Prix Jeunesse International in Germany. And I said to her, but there are no children here. And she was like, Children? Why would you have children? I said, but everything's about the children. So coming from South Africa, we always, all of our work was about integrating young people, young voices. I mean, part of the question really in 94 was whether children should be given the vote. So up to 16-year-olds, because Nelson Mandela said that 16-year-olds changed the course of our history. If you know the student uprisings in, in 1976, these were young people who changed the course of the history. So as a student activist, I was surprised that there were no young people in that meeting. Anyway, we came back from that meeting and because we always have consensus, so you ask people's opinion before you sign charters, they had out of that process developed the, 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 the children's television charter from Australia. And all of us had to go back home and, well, actually not go back home. Whilst we were there, they wanted us to sign it and endorse it. And those of us from South Africa with this whole kind of new democracy politics were saying, no, there's no way we're signing this on behalf of our country. We go back home, we have consensus, we have discussion. And we were lucky that the SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, was actually hosting a meeting of the Southern African broadcasters as well as Ortna at the time, which, as you know, was the Union of Radio and Television for Africa. And in that process, we started to say, look, there, there is this issue around guidelines, possibly, for children's television. Now, in the old South Africa, and David, you should know this, we had English and Afrikaans on television for children, for everybody. We had one, one broadcaster that only showed content in English or Afrikaans. And suddenly, we were in a new South Africa, and we realized we have 11, we now have 11 official languages and the issue that Imru brings up about diversity, which is so important, and how are we going to tackle this when content wasn't produced for young people? And Paulo Freire is from Brazil. Yes. And the issue was really around, somebody said, well, in a meeting, a white South African got up and he said, well, if black people don't have TV, why should we be even talking to them about this? Why should we produce for them? And this was for young for, for black South Africans in the context of television in our country. So the Children and Broadcasting Foundation for Africa, we were kind of a forum at the time, and then decided to formalize ourselves, and we call ourselves a foundation, and people think we have lots of money, so they keep coming to say, you're a foundation. But really it was to formalize ourselves in the work that we were doing. 
And we worked on the Africa chart on children's broadcasting, which we eventually got ratified by the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association. They call something else now. But we got the charter to every single broadcaster in Africa. So these were broadcasters through the Southern African Broadcasting Association, but also the Africa Association of Broadcasters, because Urka changed after the African Union. And more importantly, it was because we had no guidelines. There's no policy. There's nothing in government that says you should produce like this. So that's why when I sit and I listen to particularly European colleagues or people from the West, and you know, it's nice that you can say, well, you know, the Swedish, they didn't think about this. But at least there was a policy, at least there's a guideline, at least there's something that as a country you're thinking about in terms of young people. And we never had that. We still don't have that. You know, we're 25 years into democracy, and the only thing we have is this Africa Charter on Children's Broadcasting, which even the Independent Broadcasting Authority used as policy in terms of children's media in South Africa, and we are proud to say in the rest of Africa. So now when, when you talk about content for young people, you can say there is a charter. And so the first time I came to Zanzibar, in fact, the Zanzibar International Film Festival was in 99, to work with young people around the Africa Charter on children's broadcasting to really make them understand why their input was necessary. And important for me in that charter was article number four, which said children should hear, see, and express themselves their life's experiences through the electronic media that reaffirms their sense of self, community, and place. And every time I recite that, I say to people, can you see how much it meant to me that I know it by heart? Because it was important in the diversity of South Africa where English and Afrikaans were the only mediums of instruction that you never saw poor people, black people, rural people. This is for our children to only see a white world it was a huge concern for us and we needed to change that. So through the, the, the charter, we managed to get the particularly people working in the education and children's departments at the SABC as the broad, public broadcaster to begin to change the way that they produced for young people and to begin to show people, to show the diversity, to listen to different languages, to hear South Africa as a diverse country and not a white country. It's been a big challenge, and as Imru says, you know, the challenges continue. As the CBFA, we also train people, so we train both professionals and young people. We've trained about 50 broadcasters um, from Asia and Africa, really looking from the child's point of view. And I remember distinctly in a workshop with the Asia Institute of Broadcasting, we had this group of mix, it was both the Middle Eastern and, and African and Asian, in fact, uh, producers, and I said, well, you have to get a young, young people involved in the script writing, because it has to be the story of the child. And this lady was like, no, 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 I, I have the perfect story. I'm going to tell the story of the little boy who pushes the wheelbarrow as the madam is walking through the flea market, the market, to buy her goods. So I said, what, do you think the child would want that story to be told? Of course a child, of course. How lucky is that child to have his story told? So I said, okay, so whose permission do you need? Well, the parents, the school, the teachers, and I go, and the child? The child? Why would I give the child the permission? And it is in that context that you understand that people who work in broadcasting and film and media for young people don't actually engage with young people. They don't want to know what you think as a young child. And I think that is probably some of the challenges around the films that are chosen, the themes that are produced, and then the documents that come with it, and how we should create this perfect child. Of course, in our world, the perfect child doesn't exist. And while some people, um, you were talking earlier about the bus that was so full, I said, well, in our part, there are no school buses. You know, kids are walking miles to get to school. Some crossing rivers and dams, and, you know, hills to get to school. So the context is very different. So how do we bring in the magic of cinema, the magic of film into the world of the young people in my part of the world? And really the majority part of the world, I think that's something that you also have to recognize. So it's great to be in a space where people can talk about it. 
in our space, we have to kind of do it and try to see how we do it. And so we're very proud of the film that I just showed you, the, the, the clip, because we engaged with professional adults and we said you need to work with people. And all those young people, none of them had actually performed before. The boy who sings the beautiful song on, um, about his mother was a, was a child who was, he was orphaned and was left at, at an orphanage, so he was orphaned, he was at an orphanage, he was an orphan who was um, brought up by missionaries. So in his world, he hated white people and he hated women because he thought women had abandoned him. And yet in that process, as we talk about it, because he, he's really a Tracy Chapman, you know, he just takes his guitar and, and could play and sing so beautifully. Um, he would, I'd say to him, um, you know, I, I, I need a new idea or a new song and he could do it immediately. And through the process, because he hated women, I'd say, but you know, I, I'm a woman, I'm a mother. And it was that change that I think you spoke about as well, in terms of what do the children, how, how do they change in that process of filmmaking? There definitely is a change. There's definitely a different experience. For us, the film was also to deal with issues about xenophobia, racism. This, the time when we made this film, those were huge issues in South Africa. So how do we use the image, how do we use film as a medium of both entertainment and education? I think that is really important. So I hope I get the right one here. Um, by the way, I just mentioned CIFEJ, which is an NGO that we are all part of. It's the International Center of Films for Children and Young People. You can go online and find out about CIFEJ. Uh, um, membership comes from around the world. And then now what we are doing in Zanzibar is we managed to train 64 young people as filmmakers and they're producing their own films. I think the, the, the definition of a film is also interesting, you know, is it that one minute little thing or is it a 90 minute film? But what the young people have managed to do was to take stories from their milieu. I think it's really important in South Africa we say local as lekker, which is local is tasty and delicious. How do you make sure that the young people tell stories from their point of view? And I think when you talk about the canon of films somebody mentioned earlier, is really to begin to take content that is representative in some way of the locale, of where the young people come from, so it's not so far removed from what they can engage with. I think this is really important. So the lady here with the camera in her hand is actually the staff. She makes the tea in the office. And I said to her, if we are going to be training people in this office, you will be part of being trained. Because, and I could end here, you know, they always say, how do you give children, how can you? They say, just, how can you give children a camera? Do you know how expensive it is? And I say, well, in Africa, they give children an AK-47 and they ask them to kill people. So I really don't think it's such a big deal giving them a camera to tell stories. I think this is really important. So these are just some of the images. This is, this is our little office in Zanzibar. So if you can see, it's one space for everything. And we really go back to basics, where, whether it's training or education in the, in the way that you choose to use it. Um, even um, the admin lady who's, uh, who really just does all our letters, she had to be the translator. And in the end, she was like saying, oh, but you know, Fidoz, I, I'm learning so much. I think I'm going to be able to be a filmmaker. I think it's that. I think what we need to understand is that in every space, young people are learning. And whether it is because they're having to translate or because they're having to pick up the camera or because they're having to show somebody an image, that is part of that process. And so what is media education? What is it that we do? We do it every day. And two-year-olds are knowing how to swipe that mobile phone and get the images or get onto YouTube. Um, do we need to protect them? Do we need to stop them? Do we need to help them? I think somebody said that they put um, a mobile camera somewhere in a village. I want to say in India, but I could be wrong. It could be a rural village anywhere. And this group of kids came around and they looked and they played. And within a few minutes or hours, they were able to use that device. So it's really just a device. Um, how we tell the stories, what we need to tell, I suppose that's important. And so. I have some copies of the educational pack which I can share with you and I think that's me done. Thank you. Um, so our final speaker then on, on um, our panel on uh, film education in Africa is uh, Stephanie van der Beer. 
Uh, Stephanie um, is an academic. She has a PhD in, uh, speci that she specialized in North African women's documentaries from the University of Stirling. She's published widely, um, particular, particularly a monograph on the pioneering women of Arab documentaries, edited collections on art and trauma in Africa, on North African and Middle Eastern animation, and on film festivals. She also has a forthcoming uh, co-authored monograph with myself on uh, women in African cinema. She's currently a, currently a lecturer at the Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, and she's been involved in many film festivals as curator and organizer, including Africa in Motion, but also um, festivals in uh, Europe, in, in Africa, and in the US. She um, has taught at St. Andrews, Exeter, Glasgow, Stirling, Southampton, and other places. And she is uh, currently also an editor of the Edinburgh University Press's series on international directors, which is championing um, the work of women filmmakers in particular. So, um, Steph, uh, thanks very much for joining us at, at such short notice. Thanks very much um, for having me in the first place. I am absolutely aware that I do not fill Eric's boots at all. Um, what I can bring, I hope, is a little bit of insight in how Africa in Motion uh, in general, but specifically the project that I worked on called Africa's Lost Classics, how we dealt with um, bringing these films and bringing issues that are addressed in these films to a wider public, but also to uh, primary school children, to secondary school children. And then towards the end, I'll talk a little bit, like Imru did, about my experience of trying to teach African cinema in a higher education institution as well. Um, so really it's an overview of what we have done uh, in that respect practically, but also obviously that is always informed by my own research and my own sort of um, positioning as a white woman studying a cinema from a continent that is um, frankly, really rich, really diverse. It's un un impossible to really say something like African cinema it doesn't exist. It's loads of different kinds of cinema. Um, so that's always informed our approach to how we teach African film. Um, Africa's Lost Classics was um, a project that we did with Africa in Washington. It ran over a year and a little bit longer. Um, for it, we looked at films that had been lost, that had often been written about or talked about, but never in any depth, because they were um, perceived as lost, difficult to find, inaccessible, um, lost to the archives, basically. So what we did was try and bring a few of those films, um, specifically because Lizelle and I were working on it, women's films, because that's our interest, so that's our prerogative. Um, working on that, um, but one of the things that we also wanted to do was look at animation, because animation is a really rich language, uh, much richer than academia gives it credit for, um, specifically early and these lost um, films, um, because they are really international films. They are very important documents, short, little documents that are incredibly impactful for children. And we discovered this a lot of these films, a lot of these early films that are considered lost, actually deal with frogs or, or tell the stories from the perspective of frogs. So we started thinking that there's something quite interesting in there and um, looking how animals can represent certain things um, that are global in scope. Um, so that's where we discovered um, a DVD that if you are interested in older African animated uh, short films for children, you can actually buy. It's called Africa Animated, or in French, because it's, it's actually published and distributed by a French company, L'Afrique Sanime. So if you are interested in that, it is available. It's expensive, but you can get it. Anyway, what we did with these films was um, try and make them more accessible. So we've screened them at Africa in Motion in several different kinds of settings. But we also created a, a teacher pack, and uh, there are a few in the front here, if you are interested in um, looking at them, they're here. You can take them with you and uh, maybe use them if you're a teacher, but you can also download them from our website, the Africa and Motion <coughs> website. I've put links in here, and I'm very happy to make these slides uh, available to everyone if you want them. Um, so specifically what we did, because I am not an educator in the sense that I know how the curriculum in the UK works and we needed to integrate our material into the curriculum as it stands because we're very aware that 
um, primary school teachers have a very different approach to secondary school teachers, so I had to learn. I had to educate myself on the education system in the UK. So I had to collaborate with people that do know the whole system. Uh, so I worked with education um, officers from different cinema organisations, such as, for example, Film Africa, a festival in London that is run or partners with the Royal Africa Society. They have an education officer and she taught me a lot about the British education system and specifically primary schools. We also worked with Into Film, which is also a UK-based organisation that works specifically on getting film and media literacy um, integrated into the official curriculum. Um, we also worked with animators. Um, the one that we worked with is uh, called Jim Sturk. He's based in Glasgow now. He used to be based in, in um, Edinburgh. Um, we've worked with him over the years. He's done workshops with um, us at Africa in Motion and he has trained kids in one day, so quite limited uh, amount of time, but he has trained very young kids in the art of animation and making them see that they are able to tell their own stories, to create their own images and to make the things that they draw move on the screen. So it's a really exciting um, sort of template that we've um, come up with during the festival uh, that we try to keep going with because it's interesting to see all these different kids approaching their own stories and telling their own stories by creating their own little films. Um, Jim also makes them available online so that the kids can, after the workshop, then watch their own films. It's a lot of fun. Um, and he also works with the schools that the kids are usually at and where they learn about these techniques. Um, so in that way, we've sort of tried to create a little bit of a a way for Africa in Motion as a festival, but also the project that we worked on, to engage with the younger, the very young kids that need to see African films, these sort of um, internationally accessible short African films and see different kinds of storytelling, but then also give the very young kids the opportunity to tell their own story on their own screen. Um, some of the things that we've integrated into the pack um, are ideas of African storytelling because I discovered by reading about um, storytelling that storytelling is an incredibly important tool in literacy and the development of, ki of, of kids to learn how to tell their own story. Listening to stories is important to learn how to write. It's important to learn how to structure your writing. So in the long term, storytelling is incredibly important and of course, in many instances, what we know of African culture is that there is a really rich oral storytelling culture. So in the pack, we teach them about the griot, which is an African figure, mostly from West Africa, um, often called a poet or a troubadour, somebody who tells stories orally and uh, sort of helps spread specific types of knowledge that way. So we tell the kids that there are these um, figures on, uh, in the African continent that tell stories orally and they can then play with that idea of telling their own story in different kinds of ways and then obviously um, looking at the films as stories and looking at making their own stories uh, again accessible on the screen. Um, so we've tried to integrate media literacy with telling your story just as Frida was saying that really important for the kids to be able to do that themselves. Um, you'll also see in the pack that we've come up with different kinds of creative lesson plans that the teachers are then avail um, um, able to use or not as they see fit. Um, and we've made them as accessible as possible. So anybody can download them from our website. And um, on top of that, in order to, to sort of um, advertise a little bit what we've done and that it's freely available, we've also done some um, professional development workshops for teachers, so for primary school teachers. We, learned, we taught them in workshops, <coughs> together with Interfilm, how to create your own short animated film. And always based on, let's watch these short African animated stories first, because there's a different, really interesting sort of global message being told, so let's see if your kids respond to that, and then sort of learn how to create their own their own little stories. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the content of how I learned, I taught myself about the curriculum in England and how we integrated 
our African uh, film knowledge and, and part of the project on, on lost classic films um, into the pack. These are the two filmmakers that we included in the pack as well. Um, Mustafa Alassane from Niger and Jean-Michel Jean Kibushi um, from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So these are the two frog films, we started calling them the two frog films, that we um, start from in the packs, so a little bit of information on them. This information is also quite extensive in the packs so that teachers themselves feel like they're learning about African cinema as well. They're not just engaging with the films, but also with what the filmmakers have done and the process that they have gone through um, and everything that led to them becoming the filmmakers that they are. This is some of the feedback from the kids that they uh, gave us about their experience of being able to tell their own stories and making uh, their own films. Um, it's interesting to see, I, again, as I said, I will happily share these slides so you can see what they said about watching and making their own films. This is, again, some of the feedback that we received. So somewhere in the pack, we engage with the common image that children get of African cinema being through animation films, so Madagascar, The Lion King, things like that. So we try to deviate from that and make them see that there are different kinds of stories. Um, about Africa, very possible and very accessible as well. Um, this whole process that I learned was also done in collaboration, as I said, with Africa in Motion, especially Justine, who has created lots of different packs based on African animation. Here are just some images, so if you're interested, we have loads of material for teachers. Then secondary schools, it was the same process that I had to go through, except, of course, we, we raised the bar a little bit with theoretical understanding or abstract um, concepts such as race and race relations in the UK. So this was a little bit more challenging because you need to sort of strike a balance between what a teacher already knows and has experienced and how confident they are really in talking about race and race relations in the UK, which is very often very difficult to do with um, the older kids. So there, um, there's a lot of, of issues on language use and word use in that pack, and how teachers can use uh, those words or not in, in their teaching. Uh, as I said, a little bit more abstract, so we looked at concepts like freedom and democracy, as I said, race relations in the UK, also social justice, citizenship, like really more complex concepts that, um, that stimulate those older students, those 15, 16 year olds. Some of the feedback that we received at these workshops that we did appreciated that we were there to encourage an increase in confidence for the teachers to look at race and race relations in the UK and how they could address that in class. So we've given them tools and there's a lot of appreciation for that and especially at the workshop we did in London, there was a lot of really great response to that because the teachers really want to engage with this on a broad spectrum of levels, so in classes of geography, history, not just in classes dedicated to, I don't know, maybe there's a one week uh, dedicated to African culture in a school, but they want to integrate it into the whole curriculum. So that was really very excited for us, very exciting for us to find out about. And then in higher education, as Imre already hinted, it becomes increasingly complex to talk about these things. So one of the things I wanted to do with this slide is just show how as an academic, I've tried to integrate our knowledge on African cinema into courses on the history of, of or key moments in the history of world cinema and things like that. So I've included films like La Noir de by Sam Ben. And one year, the feedback was um, the African Cinema Week was especially enjoyable and I feel it was very important to um, the first quote, for example, while I do appreciate post-colonial African film, I don't think that it's more important to the history of film than the beginnings of Hollywood, for example. So feedback from the students, which becomes more and more important for us as educators, kind of shows us the big divide between what they want and what they don't want, what they want us to teach them and what they are not interested in or what they think they are not interested in or what they expect so while it becomes more and more important to listen to what the students want, what do we do with, with our knowledge? And what do we do with how we value our knowledge um, 
And what do we do with, you know, with people like me? What do I do with that knowledge, being a white woman working in Britain, being from Belgium, um, and representing something that is not mine, but that I love? So all those questions come in into the way that we look at the education system, not on all levels, from, second, from primary to secondary, to higher education. So. The worst um, possible chair because uh, we went completely over time. Um, so we are go going to continue until one o'clock. Um, so we'll, we'll, because we started with a little bit light. So I'm, I'm just going to go straight to um, to audience questions um, for our panelists. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to ask him a little bit more about what was going on because you, you hinted that there was. We well, didn't hint. You said quite clearly that John Paul was actually a problem for Black British. And you, but I think you also said that the, the movement, so the conference, you didn't mention a conference, but that movement in the 80s, there was also some problem there, but, and I didn't quite understand what you were getting at. Like, maybe I'm happy to move it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, first of all, it comes back to this question of diversity. Right? Um, there are, and we have to or should appreciate, diverse practices of filmmaking and approaches to cinema among African Caribbean, African people, black people. All black filmmakers are not the same, okay? It doesn't mean that we don't need each to exist, we do. The problem with what happened in the 80s is that the immersion or the emergence of black filmmaking within the politics of, of the media politics, of the changing media politics of the 80s that Channel 4 precipitated, was also mapped onto a politics of race relations, and a politics of class, and a politics of um, Thatcherism, etc. Okay? Some of us had begun making films in the 70s. Horace Ove made his first film in 1973, 74, pressure came out around that time. Don't forget the BFI refused to show pressure for two years because they said what was on the screen was not true. Okay? And it was representing particularly a police raid of a black cultural institution. And it by no means brutal or outrageous. Okay, so the BFI who had financed that film from Harris Ove refused to show it because they thought it, would, it, was, too out, it was not true, basically. Harris Ove came out of the first the sort of wave of young people who arrived in Britain in the 1960s. You know, he came here as a student in the mid-60s or something like that, that generation, and he wanted to be a filmmaker. Now, how could you do that? You're supposed to be a bus driver, right? But people couldn't <coughs> appreciate that black people coming from the Caribbean were artists, sophisticated artists. Mm. Right? So people like Horace Ove and Frankie Diamond Jr., for example, who made a very important film called Death Might Be Your Santa Claus, which I think ranks among any art film of the 1960s, and is a very important film in African cinema, in my view, um, were marginalized. These people traveled to Europe, they created their own spaces, um, Caribbean artist movement, etc. And he was able to negotiate his way among that, his generation. My generation comes after. We come out of black power movement, the black hearts movement, and anti-colonial politics in Britain. And we saw ourselves as independent filmmakers. When I went to the National Film School in 1979, nobody promised me anything. I didn't know how I was going to eat or live as a filmmaker. All I knew, I wanted to make films. Okay. By the time Channel 4 came along, people who were graduating saw themselves as making a living as film. People told them they were filmmakers, right? And the workshops became, don't forget the workshop history in Britain has a very interesting history, going back to the 1930s of radical film movements, but also non-industrial film practices, okay? Channel 4 co-opted that but made it into a new kind of way of organizing the film industry. Black people, because of their politics, because of the political leverage which they could, at the time, muscle at the time, was able to negotiate this space within the workshop movement. Put it in a nutshell, 
New black independent professional film company, company thrived on the Channel 4. And there's a reason for that. We can talk about it. But what thrived was a certain kind of film practice rooted in workshops. Chedo was a collective. There were about 20 people in that collective. Black Audio Sankofa were three or four people who constituted themselves into a group to make films as film artists, film activists. There's a difference politics. Okay, I had with Manilik Shabazz and Henry Martin a film company called Kumba Productions. We had an office in off Newman Street, Oxford Street, as part of a group called Production Partners. Right? Very important forum for independent producers. Nobody ever called us and said, you are the, probably one of the few black production companies. Would you like to do this or take our proposal seriously? Mm -hmm. Nobody, including the commission editors for ethnic, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et okay? So what I'm saying, there was a, there was a big wider politics. And I talked about this about in a paper I wrote that was published some year, decades ago, which is available, about that politics and the ways in which we need to problematize or look more critically at the kinds of film cultures that Britain should have responded to, the difference between the African Caribbean, the Asian, for example, and the way those two film cultures were different but could be worked to form a wider black community intervention, etc. Okay? And I've talked a little bit about that. So yes, there was a crazy serious politics. And of course, by the, the end of the 90s, the pretense of Channel 4 disappeared. Let's put it that way. Um, for those, if I could just um, ask you a question, sort of transposing that time period to South Africa. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, South Africa had uh, got television very, very late, only in 1976, because, which is the year of my birth, um, because the, um, the nationalist government at the time thought that it would just be full of kind of corrupting influences. Um, so in a way, we were kind of very slow to, to sort of catch up with visual, visual media and, and, and visual literacy. And could you, could you talk a little bit about um, the development of, of film and television and media literacy in, in, from your perspective in, in South Africa, given that we came so late mm. to the party? Well, <laughs> we did come very late to the party, and I remember as a child, so you were, you just, you were born, and I was about seven or eight, or whatever, I don't know. But the point was that we, we, we'd go and watch film, we'd go and watch TV at somebody's home. So it was quite an interesting thing that one person in the community would have a TV, and everybody, all the children from the community would go there, and it still happens. It happens in Zanzibar. You know, there's one TV set for the entire community, they're all watching sports and so forth. I think the, po the, the point for me, which is what I raised earlier, was that as a black child growing up in South Africa, I didn't see myself. I'm, 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 South, I'm Indian, South African. And those images we didn't see right through until 96, 97, when we started to question this. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it was a difficult process. But t because, te because t television and the image, it was really the theatre space, I think, that was really progressive. <coughs> And so in 76, there was a lot of alternative theater, the market theater, where we filmed that sequence with the, with the gumbo dance. Uh, you know, it's a really important space because it's a place where people across barriers of color could come together. So, you know, the South African system of apartheid was separate. We, 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 I never sat next to a white person until I was probably 20 years old. You know, you went to a separate school, you went to a separate... Uh, Whatever, you lived in an, in, in an area, so people could take your name and say, ah, okay, and they could put you in a box. So you're Indian, you live in Lanasia or wherever, and you go to a school there, and you mix with those people, and you don't mix with anybody else. And black people, the only black people you mixed with were in a subordinate role as a you know, staff or security or domestic worker. Um, so I wouldn't, even be, I wouldn't dare to say what, would, what, what happened in that space. Needless to say that a lot of people who started at that time were still at the SABC decades later. So their, their thinking was very clear about it being an apartheid agenda. So even though we got television, it was very skewed in, in the news. You know, people didn't even know when the 76 uprisings happened, white people in South Africa thought Soweto was another world away and didn't know what was going on. And, and I say that because one of the films that we did, which was actually about the 76 uprisings, 
um, called Soweto Blues. Soweto Blues was a song that uh, Yuma Sekela wrote. And uh, the, our cinematographer is Lance Giva, who's a white Jewish South African boy. And he said he was, he was apparently doing so well. He was in the US and he was um, a gymnast. And so, you know, he was doing well and everybody was so excited. And then the, the, the uprisings happened, June 16th. And he says, suddenly nobody was coming and none of the Americans were interested. And he couldn't believe nobody's interested in him. And then when they phoned home, the mother says, the father says, are you watching what's happening? And then they find out. And so for him, you know, in, in that film, he talks about how it was so far away. Soweto was so far away from us. So I think television, per se, was very remote and very far away from all of us as black South Africans. And I don't think, you know, for a lot of rural people that that has changed, even though we have more television now. Okay, okay so a very quick Thanks. question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, a very quick question, maybe for about contemporary popular genre cinema in Africa. So a lot of the talk has been about a certain kind of ideological <coughs> progressive cinema, but in fact people don't go and pay to go and see that. What do they go and pay, and are you training people to create good economic product? I don't think they go to pay to see anything. Guess correct. <laughs> it's the reality. I, th I think Nollywood is amazing. I think if you look at what, what people have managed to do then, one of the things we did was we started, um, we called it ABC, Africa's best channel, <laughs> in Nigeria. In 2010, as part of it, it's, it's uh, MIT is a big TV station in Nigeria. And, you know, they were like, are you sure you want to go there? That's such a small station. How many people? 40 million people <laughs> it caters for, because Nigeria, 200 million. Um, and in, in that space, uh, just prior, I think 1999, we started working with Nollywood. And my partner, Faith, was running uh, a channel and basically just gave people an opportunity to have a window. And people were saying, this is really bad, the quality is so poor, this is rubbish, how are you showing it? And it's moved, it's changed. And I think the way that we, that we engage with film, uh, particularly the Nigerian context, it was digital. You know, you, you, it's a VCD, it wasn't even a DVD. And you'd get it in the marketplace and people would just be exchanging it. I think that the Nigerian model, and you know, we used to have Sitengi, I don't even know, Sitengi was the market in Cape Town. And I remember inviting a group of Nigerians to the Sitengi market, and when the Nigerians walked into the room, the South Africans left, because you know, we so good. And then they basically said, well, we show you, which they did. They went back home, and they really produced, and they, you know, I met a guy who was at the time probably 24, and he was like, Oh, I made like 30 films. I was like, get out of here. <laughs> How did you do that? But they also produce on $10,000, if not less. Right. So it depends, as I say, what is a film. But the good news is that Nigerians have an appetite for Nigerian culture and content, and that's happening. The challenge in South Africa is we still have Hollywood. So a Hollywood film opens on the same day as a South African film. Nobody goes to see the South African film. <coughs> Um, Jamil Kubeka's film, which is, you know, is a really good uh, creative. His film opened, I think it closed within a week, if lucky. The Afrikaans films do very well. There's a strong Afrikaans culture. The quality of content is very high. People have been producing since the old days of, of apartheid, so the beginning of, of television. So it's very different, and also the money is there, so the economic power is there, and people <coughs> are concerned that they're losing their language. So they're producing and they pay both in music and film. Okay, yes. We can, I just, can I just make a, a comment on it? I think there's a great myth that there is some aspirational distinction to be made between those filmmakers who you might say or are usually said to produce ideological films and the Nollywood filmmakers. Mm. I think that's one of the biggest and most erroneous myths we can have on African cinema. What that misses is the cultural and economic context within which both emerged and in what the challenges were. The early filmmakers, their films were systematically kept out of cinemas. They were never allowed to reach the African audiences and that's one of the objectives of the so-called pioneers. Farid Bugodier says we need to reconquer our economic and cultural space. Nollywood arrives at a very different technological moment. But as Fidos has said, 
Nigeria has a hundred million people. You make your money from your film in one week. The rest of it is pirated. Films are shown all over the world and the, they don't make any money from that. Mm. But a producer who makes 50 films in two years, mm. like churning out, you know, hamburgers, yeah. is making enough to live and make the next film. Mm -hmm. It's an economic um, model that is not replicable anywhere else in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that is one of, another myth that we can do it in East Africa, Swahili wood and all that. And you know, it's proven not to be the case. So I'm saying we need to look at within the context in which, as I said, Africans, the African experience in and of cinema. And part of it is these institutions which provide certain kinds of access, certain kinds of censorship, and certain kinds of marginalization. One of the problems with Hollywood films, they have big budgets, oh, advertising. Market. Marketing. You know, and they monopolize the cinema screens. Yeah. That's the other thing. So those are the kind of things that but film studies needs to but cover. But it's also the media literacy, because if they had media literacy, I'm going to leave. They'd watch, they would watch in South Africa. We'd be able to have <coughs> audience development. We don't do that. The Swedes do that. The Danish, the Norwegians, you know, we don't have that. Sorry, I'm done. So I, yeah, I want to have, give you all enough time to have lunch. So thank you so much. Thank lunch. you. <laughs>